Hello. Today we are in Islamabad, capital of Pakistan, to talk to Prime Minister Imran Khan. Since decades, Pakistan and India are stuck in a tense standoff about the region Jammu and Kashmir. Pakistan also neighbors Iran, now in a violent conflict with the United States and becoming the epicenter of an increasingly volatile Middle East tensions. Facing threats from inside and outside, what are Mr. Khan's plans? Hello. Sorry to keep you waiting. Thank you very much for oh, yeah, Thank you. Let me just give you a look. Mr. Prime Minister, your job must be one of the most complicated in the world. I mean, there is your relationships with the United States, there's China who really wants to invest here, but the more they invest, the, your relationships with the United States might become even a little bit more complicated than you have Iran, Afghanistan. Before you join politics, you have had such a fantastic uh, life. Why, why do you do that to yourself? So, a few questions. Let me start. Firstly, I came into politics because uh, I felt that Pakistan has tremendous potential, always had tremendous potential when we were growing up. Pakistan was the fastest growing country in Asia. It, Pakistan was a role model for development in the 60s. So we lost our way and my whole objective of uh, coming into politics was that uh, we wanted Pakistan to achieve its potential, and it has huge potential. Now, your first question that uh, we live in a tough neighborhood, we have issues uh, balancing act because um, we have, for instance, Saudi Arabia, which is one of Pakistan's greatest friends, always been a friend in need for us. And then we have Iran, which is a neighbor and we have always had good relationship with Iran. So the, the, the conflict between Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran is something which, uh, which for, for Pakistan would be disastrous if it, uh, if it uh, went into some sort of a military conflict. So, so we are trying our best to make sure that uh, these two, uh, mm -hmm. one neighbor and one friend, do not, uh, uh, things do not, deteriorate amongst them. Things do not actually lead to a conflict. And as it is, this region cannot afford another conflict. The other is Afghanistan. Pakistan is doing its best for peace in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is one country which has suffered in the last 40 years. And just purely on a humanitarian basis, apart from Afghanistan being our neighbor, uh, we pray for this uh, peace still to take place between the Taliban and the Americans and the Afghan government. So finally, the, there would be peace there. The, the biggest problem right now is India. Mm. I'd like to catch up on that. I mean, we were nearly facing a war last year. And ever since Prime Minister Modi scrapped this special status for Indian administrated Kashmir last August, it's getting even more tense. Uh, what is your government doing or planning to diffuse these tensions with New Delhi? <clears throat> Look, I was the first uh, political leader to warn the world about what has happened in India. India has been take taken over by an extremist, a racially extremist, exclusive ideology, which is called Hinduvta. Uh, the, the ideology stems from RSS, RSS was born in 1925. It modeled its, its inspiration was the Nazi party in Germany. The founding fathers of uh, RSS um, believed in the Nazi ideology of uh, racial superi superiority. And just as uh, the Nazi uh, ideology was built on hatred for uh, another uh, minority, similarly, the RSS ideology is based on hatred for Muslims and other minorities, Christians as well. So therefore, I warn the world that this is, it, it, it is a, a tragedy for India and I think for its neighbors 
that India has been taken over by this RSS ideology, which by the way, three times was banned in India as a terrorist organization. The RSS assassinated uh, the great Mahatma Gandhi. So um, a nuclear armed country of 1.3 billion people is in the hands of extremists. And so not only are people of India going to suffer, and they are already suffering, their rights in India and their demonstrations. But Kashmir, uh, to, to be specific, 8 million Kashmiris now for over five months are in a state of siege. Mm. And it's because of the RS ideology which believes that uh, only India belongs to Hindus, other minorities are inferior. What does it mean for you? I mean, how can you handle that conflict? Do you try to talk to Maori? What are you doing? Well, when, when I first became the Prime Minister, I made every effort to uh, talk to the Indian government, Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Um, I, I, my first speech, I said, you come one step towards us, we'll come two towards you, that we can resolve all our differences through dialogue. Uh, but it soon uh, transpired that, that, uh, that there was a reason why India was not responding. And the, the reason was the RSS ideology. Mm -hmm. And this then soon became evident uh, last year when on 5th August, they unilaterally annexed Kashmir. Kashmir is a disputed territory between Pakistan and India. Uh, in, in the uh, several United Nations resolutions from 70 years ago, uh, uh, not only uh, call it a disputed territory, but the people of Kashmir were given the right by the international community, by the United Nations, mm -hmm. that they, through a, a plebiscite, they, were, they should decide their own destiny. Uh, but uh, uh, Prime Minister Khan, there are many Pakistani people who also say that the human rights situation in the Pakistani part of Kashmir is also not perfect. How do you answer to that? Uh, well, it, this is very easy. Why do we invite anyone anywhere in the world can come and see the Pakistan side of Kashmir. And they, then they go and see the Indian side of Kashmir. Mm. Let them decide what is the difference. Yeah, but still like protests against the Assad Kashmir administrations aren't allowed in Kashmir. So that's not really freedom of expression either, either isn't it? Uh, Azad Kashmir has free and fair elections. They select their own government. They run their own affairs. Uh, like in any government, they will have problems. But as I repeat again, why, why don't we invite all observers from anywhere in the world? They can go to the Pakistan side of Kashmir, mm -hmm. and then they go to the Indian side of Kashmir. They will not be allowed to go to the Indian side of Kashmir. Everything is sealed. All the top uh, leadership is in jails mm -hmm. in India. Uh, thousands of teenagers have been picked up from their homes and taken away. There's no internet facility there. There's a total clampdown. Mm -hmm. You cannot compare what is happening in India to what is in Azad Kashmir. But uh, let me stress that one more time. I mean, you you'd really take strong stance for the freedom of the Kashmir people, obviously, on both sides. Uh, and you do that also in front of the United Nations. Don't you think your voice would be even heard more and better if, like, for example, protests in Kashmir and the Pakistani side would be also allowed? Why well, not? Let me say, the, the best thing is let the people of Kashmir decide. Mm -hmm. The people of Pakistan Kashmir and the Indian Kashmir. Let them decide what they want to do. Pakistan is all ready to give them the right of, through a referendum or a plebiscite, let them decide whether they want to remain with Pakistan or whether they want to be independent. We're all for it. You're just coming back from Kashmir. I mean, there was a horrible avalanche. Uh, more than 90 people, as we know by now, uh, got killed. What is the situation there right now? It's, it's uh, climate change. That's all I can say. Very strange thing this has happened. Uh, this sort of uh, weather in, in Kashmir was unexpected and in that particular area where uh, uh, most of the people went into these two houses thinking mm -hmm. that they were safe and the avalanche when it came it just took those two houses mm -hmm. so that's where the tragedy was but uh, unfortunately this is uh, climate change now.
Uh, do you consider like some cross-border aid with India in this specific uh, field to help uh, people the most and the best? There was already cooperation because on the borderline, uh, the Pakistan side, uh, the army was already cooperating with the Indian side because there were, I think there were some losses on the other side too. But that's a good sign. So it's possible in, in really a tricky situation that both sides work, work, work together. Of course, in any humanitarian issues, we would work together. But the, the issue right now in the Indian side of Kashmir is, uh, is not just a, uh, a issue of humanitarian. It's a huge humanitarian mm. crisis. Over 100,000 people uh, of Kashmir, the Indian side Kashmir, have been killed in the last 30 years. And not just that, I mean, the, the clampdown and the, uh, since 5th August, uh, it now this is uh, the whole world should realize for five months the people of Kashmir have been put under siege. The schools are closed, they, don't, they can't lead a normal life, communications are cut off. As I said, their senior leadership is all mm -hmm. in jail. So therefore, um, I really hope that the world would take no notice of this. Pakistan cannot have normal relationship. If this disputed territory, dispute between Pakistan and India, recognized by the United Nations, mm -hmm. if they have unilaterally annexed that area, how can Pakistan start talking to them right now? Do you think the world is paying too little attention? I'm afraid, uh, and sadly, yes. Consider the sort of just the media coverage of Hong Kong, um, you know, demonstrations. I mean, Hong Kong, what, two or three people, I, th I, I don't think more than that have died. In Kashmir, the tragedy of Kashmir, what is happening, in, you can't compare the two. Mm. And why, yet is Kash that? Why, why is that? Why do you think the world <clears throat> is paying so much more attention to the Hong Kong protests regarding the situation in Kashmir? Well, I think that the Western countries, uh, unfortunately, uh, number one is the primary consideration are the markets. It's commercial interest. India is a big market. So that's one reason why we see a very lukewarm response to what is going on and what is happening to 8 million people, let alone what is happening inside India to the minorities, what this uh, RSS-driven ideology is doing with this uh, Citizen Registration Act and this uh, Citizenship Act, which is blatantly against uh, um, the minorities, specifically 200 million Muslims. I mean, this is unheard of what they're doing right now in India. But specifically on Kashmir, uh, the silence of the world is number one because uh, of commercial interests, India being a big market. And number two, I think, uh, in the strategic uh, uh, Western mind, India is supposed to be a counterbalance to China. And therefore, you, you see a completely different approach to what is the all this uh, and I'm afraid this is uh, going to pose a threat not just to Pakistan and the neighboring countries or, or to the Indian minorities, but eventually this will be a threat to world peace. Because remember, if, uh, if this goes wrong, in other words, this rhetoric of the uh, Indian army chief saying that they, they put claim on Pakistan side of Kashmir too, and is saying something like if there was a parliament resolution, then the Indian army was ready to move to the Pakistan side of Kashmir. Then what, what would happen? The unthinkable would happen. Two nuclear armed countries would come face to face. And that's why I, even in the United Nations, I went there uh, to the General Assembly and I appealed to the UN that you must intervene right now before things get out of hand. Because Mr. Khan, what could, what could Europe and what could Germany specifically do in that regard? I think Germany has a huge role. German, Germany is, is the strongest country in Europe uh, and therefore the European Union. Germany can play a part in the EU, which is a big, uh, uh, you know, one of, uh, apart from the US, EU is the other uh, big block which uh, the world looks for upholding human rights. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we hope that Germany plays its part. I spoke to uh, Chancellor Merkel and I tried to explain to her everything about 
what is happening in India. And actually she did make a statement when she was in India saying that you cannot have this uh, go on for unlimited period of time where for 8 million people are put, put under siege by 900,000 Indian troops. Mm -hmm. So she's, she did uh, speak about it, but I think, uh, and I hope that Germany will uh, speak out against what is happening. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, you talked about minorities. Your government's cut a poor corridor is along. Indian Sikhs to visit a, a really important place uh, of pilgrimage here in Pakistan. And you got a lot of uh, applause for that. Um, do you think it can help uh, to uh, improve the relationship with India? You see, uh, I, have, I have not understood that what was the mindset I mean, uh, no logical mind would not go towards solving, and I'm talking about Indian leadership and Pakistani leadership, any logical mind would want to have peace and solve our issues through dialogue. Mm. It's logical because, you know, uh, when, you, when you trade, we know in European Union that once the trade starts between two countries, then the standard of living goes up in both the countries. Uh, even if you suffer for an imbalance for a, st for a short time, but eventually everyone benefits from trade. So this is the, what I, I had in mind when I spoke to the Indian Prime Minister when I first won the elections. And the whole idea was that, uh, you know, to alleviate poverty in the subcontinent, the best thing would be for India and Pakistan to start trade. Are you planning something for the Hindu community as well, uh, so that they, uh for example, would be allowed to have uh, a visa-free travel to India to visit their uh, places there? Uh, at the moment, it's, it's just a corridor. Kartarpur mm -hmm. is just a corridor. where they Because it's one of the most sacred. In fact, it is the most sacred place for, for, for the Sikh community. And it was only four kilometers from the border. So we thought that, you know, why should the Sikh community not be able to visit it from India or anywhere else in the world? And that would mean that the Hindu community also, it would be easier for them to go to India as well in a long, in a, you know, in a bigger thinking, in a bigger picture. Do you working on that? Um, yes, we would like that. But at the moment we have this tension going on. You know, there's a bombing on the line of control right now between in Kashmir uh, so the, we have this uh, tense, and as I said, the Indian Army chief just gave a threat in Pakistan that they could annex Pakistan side of Kashmir too. So we have a temporary problem, but in the long run, and I hope a sane government comes to India, which is not uh, driven by this mad uh, racist ideology, what would be best for the subcontinent is if we can live in harmony with each other and trade with each other. And of course, there's only one difference, and that is Kashmir. And if that could be resolved according to what the United Nations Security Resolution was 70 years ago. Talking about the subcontinent, it's such a beautiful part of the world. Uh, I mean, especially Pakistan as well. Wouldn't it be great if you could kind of let tourism blossom and get more people here to visit these beautiful sites? <coughs> we have. We have. We are opening up Pakistan for tourism. We have. Uh, uh, for 70 countries, we have decided to give them visa on the airport. So it's a big change in Pakistan. We, have, we are really opening up our country for tourism. Pakistan is actually one of the most undiscovered uh, uh, tourist, tourism paradise of the world. There's, our northern areas, are, if, you, if people like mountain tourism, I think there is no, the most unique place in the world uh, uh, as far as mountain tourism go are the northern areas. So what else are you going to do to improve tourism or to grow the, the it's also an economical branch, right? I mean. Uh, well, for a start, our security situation has now improved. Pakistan has, uh, you know, been the safest since, since 2004. You know, really problems in Pakistan started after 2004 when we joined the war on terrorism and so Pakistan came in the eye of the storm and we lost a lot of people, 70,000 Pakistanis died in this war. But now this is the safest year after 2004, so we are heading now towards 
uh, security in this country. And that's why, as it is, tourism doubled in Pakistan last year. So as it is, because of the secure environment, we are having a lot of tourists now. Mr. Prime Minister, when we talk about uh, security issues, we have to talk about Afghanistan. What is the current status of the Afghan peace talks? Uh, as far as I know, they were heading towards a ceasefire. Uh, and we hope that uh, this happens. Because uh, I repeat again, Afghanistan is a great tragedy. For 40 years, people of Afghanistan have suffered. Uh, through conflict. And so what we're hoping is now uh, the Taliban-American uh, talks succeed uh, and with the new uh, government in power of Afghan government, again, of course, President Ghani being uh, re-elected, we hope that now there's some sort of a peace agreement which is, uh, ap uh, apart from the people of Afghanistan, the next country that is desperate for that peace agreement is Pakistan because it opens up uh, opportunities for trading right up in Central Asia. It becomes uh, an economic corridor for us, uh, trading between if the, 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 the more peace returns to Afghanistan, the more people in, in especially in our KP, uh, the adjoining province to Afghanistan will benefit. Mm. So, um, as, as I said, we are praying that uh, this works out, this peace deal. Now. You really were quite a big, bit of a help for the United States. How close is your connection to the Taliban right now? Well, Pakistan has uh, done its, uh, played its part in the peace talks. We've encouraged the peace talks. And secondly, also, we have, uh, 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 you know, there was a hostage situation. So Pakistan played its part in uh, getting the there were three Western hostages, which or two, which were released. So we, we are doing our best. And whatever influence, because remember, there are 2.7 million Afghan refugees in Pakistan. So whatever uh, part we can play because of still the uh, refugees and whatever linkages Pakistan has with the Taliban, because remember, Pakistan was the government that had recognized the Taliban government, uh, which was there till 2001. So, so we will do our best. Is India's increasing influence in Afghanistan a threat for you? How, what do you make of that? It's, it's uh, well, any country, Afghanistan is an independent country and it can have relationship with anyone. Our problem was really when um, uh, uh, Pakistan, our security forces felt that India was instigating attacks into Pakistan through Afghanistan. Mm. That was the main concern of Pakistan. Uh, apart from that, well, it's uh, India and Afghanistan relationship is between the two countries. But it, it only affects us when we feel that India uses Afghanistan to mm -hmm. have terrorist attacks within Pakistan. Mr. Prime Minister, you were quite critical about the reception of the world regarding Kashmir and India. When it comes to China and the Uyghurs, you are not really very critical about this issue. Why is that? I mean, you really kind of like to stress the fact that, that you see yourself as a bridge builder in the Muslim world. Why are you not more outspoken about the situation of the Uyghurs in, in China? Uh, well, well, two reasons, really. Number one, you cannot even, um, the scale of what is happening next door in India, you cannot compare that to what is, hap what, what is supposed to be happening to the Uyghur community in, in China. I mean, just look at the scale. Eight million people in Kashmir are in an open prison for five months. So hence, I speak about that. Number two, 200 million Muslims right now in India. With the Citizen Act, what we fear is disenfranchisement of these people. Uh, you know, remember that in, uh, in, in 1935, when um, the Nazis started the program against the Jews, first they had the Registration Act. Similarly, in Myanmar, they first started a registration act of Muslims and then started the ethnic cleansing from, uh, of the Rohingya Muslims. So this is the first step and hence, that is my number one. I mean, it is the, the scale of the problem is so huge. That's why I talk about it. Uh, but there's a, a second reason too. China has been a great friend to Pakistan. Uh, China has helped us in our most difficult time again because of we, the crisis we inherited, the economic crisis. So 
the way we deal with China is that when we talk about uh, things, we talk about privately. We do not talk about things uh, uh, with China in public right now because they're very sensitive. That's how they deal with issues. Mm. Very last question. You know, or you knew Lady Diana very well. What do you make of the current situation uh, in Great Britain with the royals? What would she have said to what her youngest son is doing right now? Do you know what? I, I, you know, I have uh, so many issues right now dealing in Pakistan. It doesn't seem to be a, that huge issue if someone... I mean, it's their life, really. It's how they want to lead. Uh, why should people interfere in it? Would she have understood it? I guess so. I, I can't say. I mean... Uh, Frankly, I haven't really gone that deeply into a situation. I think a young couple want to, as far as I know, want to lead their own life. Well, it's up to them. Thank you very much.